Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Big Well Emerging Low Voices series. Today with us we have the pleasure to host in the Big Well campus Dr. Michelle Coleman from Swansea University. Michelle, welcome to Brunel University London. It's a pleasure to have you with us. You specialize in international criminal law. Do you want to tell us a bit how did you reach this specialization, this end of your journey? What was your academic journey? Sure. Well, thanks, thanks very much for having me. Um, I, I'm American and uh, I went to law school in the U.S. at Villanova. Um, and then I practiced law for a bit as a public defender there in, in New Jersey. Um, and I got interested in international criminal law because I thought that um, if I did a master's in uh, international criminal justice, then I would be able to take ideas from other places and bring them back to help um, represent my clients better. So I, I did a master's um, in international criminal justice and human rights at Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> and I ended up uh, falling in love with international criminal law. Um, so then I did my PhD at Middlesex. What was the instigation, a particular professor, a particular assignment? What clicked your interest in international criminal law? You know, I don't know. I think because it was, uh, it was so different and also because, you know, I've always been kind of interested in uh, the ideas of proof and, and innocence and guilt and things like that. And in international criminal law, we have these high profile situations that sometimes result in crimes. And it, it just really piqued my interest. And when the Netherlands, the cradle of international law, the Hague, all the international courts, including the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. And you worked in the International Criminal Court. So do you want to tell us a bit about your experience there and what do you think, what were the conclusions when it comes to international criminal justice? Well, uh, yeah, so after my master's, I, um, I worked at the International Criminal Court um, in the Victims Reparation Victims Participation and Reparation Services um, for about six months. Um, and basically I was brought in as part of a team to help uh, deal with uh, the applications for participation in the Bemba case. Um, and it was a really interesting experience to be there working on that, to, um, to be dealing with the applications, to be dealing with the office in general, learning more about victims' rights. I didn't really know a lot about Michelle, that. I'm compelled to ask you here, because you actually had the experience, as you said, also in the U.S. and now also in the international field. How easy is it for the victims to find their voice when it comes to criminal law? Either in the domestic sphere, it's maybe easier because we're talking about individuals. Uh, but when it comes to mass atrocities, maybe it's more difficult for victims to actually be vindicated and actually justice to be distributed. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, the victims have, victims have different, there are different ways of dealing with them in domestic courts and international courts, of course. And in some ways in domestic courts, there is more opportunity for them to have their voices heard because they deal, they can often deal directly with police so they can tell their individual story to the police and perhaps the prosecutor and perhaps in court. And then maybe if there's a conviction during the sentencing, they can give um, an impact statement to describe how they were affected. But the participation is really uh, removed, I guess. It, it's, not a, it, it's direct in that they are individually participating, but it's not direct in that it, it doesn't, they can't, for example, have a lawyer to represent them, or um, they aren't a party or a participant in the court um, system. Whereas in international criminal law, and particularly at the International Criminal Court, um, they can par directly participate as a, uh, a part, not a party, but as a participant to the trial. Um, however, <laughs> that comes with the downside that so far, although they are entitled to individual re representation and individual participation, They've only been participating in big groups, um, which is really part of the practicalities of the court because there's so many victims for these, these situations. Um, and, and maybe so also in the international proceedings, because of the vast number of the victims, the individuals lose up to a point their individual story. Mm -hmm. Gramsci says, for example, one murder is a tragedy, many murders is statistics. And this may be something that international criminal courts have to struggle and to find a solution uh, to this issue. 
in order to distribute justice and actually listen to each individual story. Yeah, I, you know, I think that their individual stories do get a bit lost. As a collection of people, the, the story is told, and of course some people do participate as witnesses, and that allows them to testify and tell their personal story. Um, but yeah, I do think that their, their individual stories do get lost, but at the same time, when we're talking about hundreds or thousands of victims, the ability for the International Criminal Court to listen to each individual story becomes practically impossible. And so I'm not sure, I, I think that the International Criminal Court and international justice plays an important role for providing justice for victims, but I'm not sure if it's about truth-telling and story and storytelling and personal experience. I'm not sure that the court is the, the place for it. That's why we have many alternative mechanisms of distributive justice and transitional mm -hmm. justice and other also mechanisms and routes. For example, also we have the sentencing phase where psychologists come in to, in order to assess the trauma of the people and the reparations, of course, phase where, in instance, the victims may be uh, given uh, some reparations for their plight. But maybe all this experience of yours build up also regarding your academic main interest, which is the presumption of innocence. And we have to say here to our viewers and listeners. So if you want to tell us a bit, Michelle, about the presumption of innocence, first of all, how were you led to the specific uh, theme for your PhD and, of course, for your book, which is published by Rutledge uh, Press? Sure, yeah. I mean, my, my interest in the presumption of innocence really does come from my practice in the United States, right? So as I was practicing, I was only defending, um, I, I wasn't prosecuting at all, and um, it came to, I came to realize that the presumption of innocence and, and what meant something different to each of the participants in the trial, right? The judge thought it was one thing, the prosecutor thought it was something else, I thought it was something else, my client thought, oh, this is something else entirely. And it got me thinking, well, what is it? Is is it a thing, or is it just kind of an idea? Um, can it be, you know, does it have meaning in court, basically? And so I took that idea, um, and then when I came to uh, applying for my PhD, that's the idea I, I applied with, was to ex examine what the presumption of innocence is. And it ended up being, um, I looked at international human rights and the international criminal justice systems um, to try to, to see kind of what it is and, and how it's used, and then kind of developed a framework, and, um, and that's the, the book as well. You point out to an existential debate here in uh, international criminal law, whether, as you said, the presumption of innocence is being experienced differently by different actors. But do you think that international law has an existential crisis? Meaning, do you think that, in essence, this can apply to all the notions of law, in essence, because we have the critical legal studies, the Marxist theory, tells us in essence that law is basically politics, that there is nothing necessarily as an objective substance of law, and law is being influenced by different, also political in this case, or economic parameters. So do you think what you say reminds me maybe of this approach? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I think uh, if we understand law as a social science, if we understand the study of law as a social science, then law I mean, first of all, it's, it's written by people and it's experienced by people. And, and through that experience of having trials and practicing law, the law shifts and changes and everything else. And I think that ideally people would experience the law the, sa the same as, and it would continue forward as it evolves. But what happens, yeah, I do think that there is some experience of the law differently. Um, but hopefully with the study of law coming from all these different angles, as, as you said, um, hopefully we come to some core, core bit of it. Do you think that this is more acute in international law? We have also different states from all over the world, different continents. I do, yeah. I think um, politics always plays a, a role in law and certainly in domestic law as well. But in international law, partly I think we're more aware of it because it's happening now, you know, it's a new-ish part of the law, um, and certainly the International Criminal Court itself is quite relatively new, um, and so we can see the interplay of politics and also um, just different actors in real time, which 
You have to ask yeah. about the United States. You are a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. And we know that the United States initially embraced the International Criminal Court in Divo, but at a particular point, they decided not to ratify the Rome Statute, and hence they have taken a certain attitude towards the court. Uh, do you think that the International Criminal Court is being depicted accurately in the U.S. public opinion? Uh, why do you think that the U.S. actually undertakes this stance and whether you think that maybe it's a matter of a political leadership and maybe something will change with new administration, with new politicians in the future? I think, well, I think this is really asking about two different things. In, in terms of the political, like politicians and leaders and things like that, yeah, of course the attitude can change. Of course, you know, the country could decide to ratify, they could decide to, you know, go with it. Um, or they could stay as they are. Um, I think that in terms of actually being in the U.S. and public opinion, I think most Americans don't necessarily have any opinion of the International Criminal Court. Um, and if they do, they, uh, my, in my experience, a lot of people ask me about transnational issues when I talk about the International Criminal Court, such so as money laundering or trafficking or things like that, which are obviously different from which is a very much uh, important and interesting what you say. Maybe the ICC, the International Criminal Court, should boost maybe its campaign of accessibility to the American public or other audiences around the world, which people maybe are not so much aware of the work of the court, and uh, of any fears of militarization that may not be existent or may be existent, depending on the circumstances always. But I want to ask you about this particular point that you raised now, about the nexus between transnational and international. And of course, in the University of Swansea, you teach criminal law, one of the core modules. And uh, having uh, excelled in international criminal law, the question is whether you think that criminal law or international criminal law is just the transnational application of criminal law, or it's a new creation. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a new creation, um, because of course, we've been trying international crimes since well, in the modern term since Nuremberg. Um, but I do think that certainly the crimes, the core crimes are different from national crimes and, and very few nations have, have written these sort of crimes into their statutes or, or not consistently and even fewer have had trials and that sort of thing. So I do think it's capturing something that domestic criminal law wouldn't normally capture. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, in, uh, yeah, I think it's very similar to domestic law in a lot of ways. Procedurally, um, I see a lot of similarities. But then we have also a fight between common law jurisdictions and continental law jurisdictions about which one is going to impact for the international legal order and mm -hmm. their own statutes. Yeah, yeah. We so is it a fight or a kind of a conciliation apparatus international criminal law and their own statute? A synthesis or antithesis, if we use the Greek terminology? <laughs> I think, well, you know, I think that it is a bit more of a synthesis than, than perhaps it might appear on the surface. It looks like, it, when it, looking at kind of the procedural issues and the evidence issues, they are being used consistently in their own way, which is a, a bit of combination of common law and civil law. I think that some, a lot of the issues where there would be um, a, a real clash of ideas, uh, like, for example, the ju a judges versus jury, right? Um, those were settled in the Rome Ram Statute, right? The ICC has judges. Um, I, th I think that, yeah, it, there are sometimes clashes, but overall, I think it's a synthesis. And speaking about synthesis now, I have to go again to return to the presumption of innocence. And we see that it's being clamped inside the whole idea of the right to fair trial. This is the case with the European Convention on Human Rights and other international human rights documents. Do you think that the inclusion of the presumption of innocence inside the general thematic of the right to fair trial does justice to the presumption of innocence? Or should we see it on an autonomous basis in the different international human rights law documents as figuring as the right, the presumption of innocence? Yeah, I, so I think that um, it, we see two different ways of it being portrayed. It depends on what the court is, right? So in the human rights courts, it is under fair trial rights, 
um, and in kind of the general international documents like the um, UN Declaration of Human Rights and things like that, it's included within fair trial rights, which is fair, right? It is part of a fair trial. But when it comes to specialized courts, the presumption of innocence has usually has its own standalone right. Like at the ICC, um, Article uh, 66 is um, the presumption of innocence, and it lays out the three terms of that. And so I think it depends on how specialized it is. Uh, and at, the, at its core, it does deal with fairness. So I think that while it is not fairness on its own, I tell you this, I raised the issue. In. Because in essence, somebody could argue, if the presumption of innocence had an autonomous sort, then maybe it could be broadened beyond the scope of the trial. Because also we have the phases that come before the trial. Mm -hmm. And of course we know the presumption of innocence starts from the moment somebody's been indicted for a crime. So maybe that's why it's not accurate to say that it should be only seen under the spectrum, under the lens of the right to fair trial. It also covers the stages before the actual main trial. Sure, yeah, I mean it does, uh, it, I mean it could even be affected. Things like said in the media or by public of officials or things can affect the presumption of innocence at trial, even if they were said before someone was indicted. Um, but, so yeah, I see what you mean, and it is much wider than the trial itself. Uh, but it, I guess if you think of the trial as the whole process, including the situation and the, um, the charges and all of that stuff, then... So once again, we turn to the interpretation of the terminology, what we mean by trial. Yeah. And on this, we touch upon the main core of your article, or your piece that you wrote for opinion use, about the language, the importance of language when it comes to incitement, when it comes to international crimes. And we have, of course, again, the crime of incitement, that if somebody incites uh, to violence or to genocide, especially after the Rwanda genocide. But do you think that the international law has tackled enough sufficiently the issue of language so far when it comes to international crimes? Uh, no, I think actually that's a really fruitful area to, to think about. Um, I've recently been thinking about this kind of, you know, the presumption of innocence can be violated through public statements of guilt in the media. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, people who are inciting violence can use the media to bolster their reputation and things like that. I've been kind of thinking about this kind of dichotomy between those two things. And, uh, you know, also with the language issue, you know, with the presumption of innocence, it has to be so specific to violate the presumption of innocence. You basically have to say, uh, this person is guilty of this crime at this time or, or whatever before they are convicted in order to violate it. Um, and. So far, we've seen a lot of things come close at the International Criminal Court, but the court hasn't found a violation. So I think it's, you know. This is the balance of the International Court strike, strike between actually indicting somebody for violating the presumption of innocence, but also keeping the freedom of speech, as you say now. Mm -hmm. I want also to ask you, which I think it's a very interesting uh, sphere when it comes to the presumption of innocence. We speak about always about criminal law, international criminal law. What about civil law, civil liability? Then we don't have any discussion about presumption of innocence. Do you think as an academic now writing about the presumption of innocence that uh, any expansion could include uh, potentially some writings about civil law, civil liability? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, the thing about the presumption of innocence is that it's just not recognized by courts outside of criminal law at all. And I think that has to do with holding the standard of proof to be quite high in criminal law, you know, so it, it gives you the floor, the judge has to come in thinking someone is innocent, and then it has to reach the standard of proof, whatever that standard is. And I, so I think that the presumption of innocence really kind of gives this instruction and, uh, and leveling process to criminal law, right, in terms of forcing the standard of proof. In civil law, I think it might work, it could work, but because of the lower standard of proof and kind of the like mixing of or the the idea that you need less proof to have liability. Not sometimes in civil law maybe you must have an objective standard of liability. For example, pollution cases. 
sometimes you must be able to hold somebody accountable without necessarily going to the minutes whether somebody uh, was guilty because the aim of civil law, of civil liability, maybe is different than criminal liability. Mm -hmm. But with this aim in mind, I want also to pinpoint to you something that you have written about also in the past, the fragmentation issue, the fragmentation of international law. We have professors like Philippa Webb and others having written books also uh, on the subject. Uh, you have written, you have spoken specifically about the fragmentation of international criminal law. Do you think that fragmentation is more pertinent when it comes to international criminal law vis-a-vis -vis other fields of international law? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think that there is fragmentation in all areas. I mean, I imagine there is in all areas of international law. Um, whenever you have multiple systems kind of working together or the political aspects. Because for the people now who are also maybe viewing us and listening to this uh, interview, uh, usually when we speak about international law, international criminal law is always the flag post mm -hmm. that we want international justice. And sometimes, although international law is applicable, we forget that international law is also international commercial arbitration, other fields of law, international maritime law. So when it comes to international criminal law, maybe the expectations of the international community are bigger. And that's the question whether the fragmentation of international law affects more the enterprise, the building of international law, when it touches the international criminal law aspects. You know, that's a really good point. I think that um, the, it, it, we worry about it more in international criminal law, for sure. I think part of that is because it's a, a really evolving process, um, but also in part because if we're thinking about these things like justice and we're thinking about punishment and, you know, this really kind of um, important liability issues, um, then any fragmentation is highlighted. So we're more aware of it because we're worried, well, is that affecting fair trial rights or is it affecting the victims or how is it affecting the trial process? Because we need it to run smoothly because otherwise, well, because justice needs to be done and justice needs to be perceived as being Because done. one of the main issues when it comes to fragmentation of international criminal law is whether Africa should have a different international criminal court. Uh, I will not, or if you want to voice an opinion on this, I don't want, I don't know if you want to say something, a brief comment uh, on whether Africa should have a different international regional uh, criminal court or you think the international criminal court is enough in order to try all universal crimes? I think that the International Criminal Court is really overburdened. It has a lot of responsibility covering crimes all over the world, and it doesn't really have enough funding or resources to do that effectively or consistently across all situations. In my you know, imagination of what might be a great way of solving this problem is perhaps regional courts, perhaps regional international courts. Which That's what I mentioned. It. I mentioned Africa because in the past we've had voices that saying that sending African maybe <laughs> leaders or African politicians to The Hague is not a solution of addressing maybe any crimes that uh, happened uh, in the African continent. And of course, it's not only Africa. International war crimes happen all over the globe. This has to be evident for our viewers and listeners. And Michelle, before we close, <laughs> to return back to you as a person, as an academic, you teach, as we said, criminal law now in the University of Swansea. And the question is uh, there, how do you see uh, criminal law is a core module? How do you see your academic aspirations, meaning uh, you aspire to teach uh, other modules? And how do you see your teaching experience? Oh, well, um, yeah, no, I, I really enjoy teaching, um, aside, in addition to the research, of course. Um, and I think that it, it provides actually a lot of conversation and, and thinking about the basic issues in criminal law and, and things like that. I do teach uh, criminal law and evidence, um, and I love teaching both. Um, I would hope to, in the future, teach um, more more specialized topics as well, perhaps international criminal law or public international law, things like that. And I think it's important for the students to understand, even the students who want an international career, that unless, as you said in the beginning of this conversation of ours, unless you master the domestic realms, 
You cannot make the leap and go to the international sphere. So, as you said, in your career, first you mastered domestic criminal law, and then you were much more able in order to deal also with international parameters of criminal law. Yeah, I think it is difficult to go just directly to international criminal law without having the basics. The theory is quite similar between domestic and international, and having the basics really helps. And also when you mentioned evidence law, which is very much contemporary, meaning the technological means of acquiring new pieces of evidence. Now in Ukraine, for example, we know that all these technological means have been implemented. Uh, we speak about video images, about uh, the social media, and of course challenges that this way of acquiring evidence uh, actually presents. Uh, with this, we close this interview, mm -hmm. Michelle. Thank you very much for being with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Dr. Michelle Coleman from Swansea University. I am Dr. Sol Solomon here in Brunel University, London. And uh, we thank you for actually watching and listening to this episode of the BUL Emerging Law Voices series. <laughs>